The deadly evolution of water speed records represents humanity's most dangerous obsession with velocity, where brave pilots strapped themselves into floating missiles, pushing past 300 miles per hour on water. Since 1911, over a dozen speed demons have paid the ultimate price, chasing glory across glassy lakes. But here's what nobody tells you about these records. The current one has stood unbroken for nearly half a century. Not because we can't go faster, but because we've literally run out of people willing to die trying. The technology exists to shatter one Australian's 1978 record. Yet, the graveyards are full enough that even thrill-seekers think twice before dancing with physics at the edge of possibility. Picture this, it's 1911 and some absolute madman named Gar Wood decides that steam engines are for chumps. While everyone else is still figuring out how to make cars reliable, Wood slaps a gasoline engine into a boat and hits 45 miles per hour on the Detroit River doesn't sound fast. Your grandmother's Corolla goes faster backing out of the garage. But on water, where every ripple becomes a potential launching ramp, this was like breaking the sound barrier. The thing about water that most people don't realize is that it's about as forgiving as concrete when you hit it wrong. At 45 miles per hour, water starts acting less like a liquid and more like a vindictive X. It'll slap you hard if you approach it wrong. Wood's boat, Miss America, wasn't just fast. It was the first vessel to prove that internal combustion engines could handle the brutal pounding that comes with hydroplaning. By the 1920s, the British decided they couldn't let the Americans have all the fun. Enter K. Don and his boat, Miss England, too. These weren't your weekend fishing boats. We're talking about 2,000 horsepower Rolls-Royce aircraft engines stuffed into wooden hulls that were basically shaped like suppositories with attitude. The builders literally took leftover World War I fighter plane engines and thought, you know what would be mental? Let's put this in water. Hey, if you're enjoying this wild ride through history's most insane water achievements, hit that subscribe button right now. Trust me, you'll want to stick around, because coming up, I'm going to tell you about a boat that literally took off and flew for 300 feet, while the driver was still inside, probably questioning every life choice he'd ever made. The 1930s is when things got properly bonkers. This is the decade when Sir Malcolm Campbell, yes, the same lunatic who was setting land speed records, decided that risking his life on solid ground wasn't exciting enough. Campbell took his boat, Bluebird K3, powered by a Rolls-Royce R engine, the same type that would later power the Spitfire, and pushed it to 126 miles per hour in 1937. Here's something they don't teach in history class. Campbell's mechanics had to develop entirely new ways to keep these engines cool. On land, you've got airflow. In water, you're basically sitting in a bathtub going twice the highway speed limit. They ended up rooting lake water through the engine in ways that would make modern engineers weep. The cooling system alone weighed more than most modern jet skis. But the real innovation wasn't the speed. It was the hull design. Campbell's team discovered that at certain speeds, the boat would start porpoising, bouncing up and down like a dolphin on cocaine. The solution? They added steps to the hull, creating air pockets that helped the boat plane properly. It's the same principle that makes modern speedboats work. Except Campbell was figuring this out while traveling fast enough to water ski without the skis. World War II put a temporary halt to officially trying to kill yourself for sport, but it gave us something even better. Jet engines. After the war ended, you had all these fighter pilots who'd gotten addicted to speed and danger, plus warehouses full of surplus jet engines that the military was practically giving away. It was like Christmas morning for speed freaks. The late 1940s saw the introduction of prop riders, boats where the propeller was partially out of the water. Imagine trying to control a boat where half of your propulsion system is in the air. It's like trying to drive a car where the rear wheels randomly leave the ground. 
The boats would literally hop across the water, with drivers reporting that they spent more time airborne than on the surface. This is where our story takes a turn toward the genuinely terrifying. In 1952, Stanley Sayers and Ted Jones built Slow Motion 4, which sounds like a reggae band, but was actually a revolutionary hydroplane that hit 178 miles per hour. The secret? They figured out that if you could get most of the boat out of the water, you'd have less drag. The boat rode on just three small points two sponsons in front and the prop at the back. It was basically flying while occasionally tapping the water to say hello. But here's the dark part nobody talks about. Between 1950 and 1959, water speed record attempts killed more people than the previous four decades combined. John Cobb, who held the land speed record, died in 1952 when his jet boat Crusader literally disintegrated at 240 miles per hour on Loch Ness. Witnesses said it looked like someone had thrown a boat into a blender. The impact was so violent that Cobb's body was found with almost every bone broken. They're still finding pieces of it today. Donald Campbell, Malcolm's son, picked up where his father left off with Bluebird K7, the first successful jet-powered hydroplane. This wasn't just strapping a jet engine to a boat. Campbell's team had to completely reimagine what a speedboat could be. The K7 looked more like a fighter jet that had lost its wings than a traditional boat. It had a stabilizing fin like an aircraft, and the cockpit was fully enclosed, because at 200 plus miles per hour, raindrops hit like bullets. Still with me? Good, because the next part involves a boat that went so fast, it literally couldn't stay in the water. Make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell, because the 1960s is where physics and human ambition had their most spectacular arguments. The 1960s gave us Woodstock, the moon landing, and Donald Campbell systematically breaking his own record seven times between 1955 and 1964. By 1964, he'd pushed Bluebird K7 to 276 miles per hour on Lake Dumble Young in Australia. At that speed, the boat was experiencing forces that would make a fighter pilot pass out. Campbell reported that the boat would sometimes travel for hundreds of yards completely airborne, not hydroplaning, but actually flying. Here's a fact that'll blow your mind. At 276 miles per hour on water, the margin between success and catastrophe is about half a degree of angle. Tilt the nose up slightly too much, and you're doing a backflip at four times the highway speed limit. Tilt down, and you're submarining into what might as well be a concrete wall. Campbell described it as riding a bullet while trying to thread a needle in a hurricane. The controversial part. Campbell was increasingly relying on benzedrine, basically speed, to maintain his concentration during runs. This wasn't uncommon. Many record attempts of this era were fueled by various um, performance enhancers that would get you banned from modern sports faster than you can say drug test. The physical and mental demands were so extreme that pilots were literally drugging themselves just to stay alert enough to survive. Then came January 4, 1967. Campbell was attempting to break 300 miles per hour on Coniston Water in England. On his return run, Bluebird K7 lifted off the water, did a complete backflip, and crashed. Campbell's last words, captured on the onboard recorder, were, I'm going. The crash was so violent that it took 34 years to recover his body from the lake bottom. After Campbell's death, most sane people decided that maybe 300 miles per hour on water was fast enough. Enter Lee Taylor and Ken Warby, two men who apparently looked at Campbell's crash footage and thought, I could do that better. Lee Taylor's boat, Hustler, was powered by a surplus J-79 turbojet from an F-104 Starfighter. This engine was designed to push a fighter jet past Mach 2. Taylor's approach to safety was essentially go so fast that you outrun the danger. In 1967, he hit 285 miles per hour, but the real drama came in 1980 when Hustler crashed at over 300 miles per hour. 
killing Taylor instantly. The boat literally disappeared. One second it was there, the next it was confetti. But let's talk about Ken Warby, the absolute madman who still holds the record today. Warby was an Australian who built his boat, Spirit of Australia, in his backyard for less than $10,000. While everyone else was using military-grade equipment and massive budgets, Warby was literally building his record breaker with parts from junkyards and military surplus stores. On October 8, 1978, Warby hit 317.6 miles per hour on Blowering Dam in Australia. What makes this even more insane is that he did it in a boat he built himself, with a jet engine he bought for $65 from a surplus auction. The engine was from a Westinghouse J-34, originally used in fighter jets. Warby's record has now stood for 46 years, making it one of the longest-standing speed records in any category. The secret to Warby's success? He was an actual engineer who understood fluid dynamics, not just an adrenaline junkie with a death wish. He spent years perfecting the design, testing in small increments, and most importantly, knowing when to quit. After setting the record, Warby retired from record attempts, saying, I've been lucky twice. I won't push it a third time. So why hasn't anyone broken Warby's record in nearly half a century? It's not for lack of trying. Since 1978, at least six people have died attempting to break the water speed record. The problem isn't technology. We have materials and engines that make 1976 look like the Stone Age. The problem is physics, and physics is an unforgiving mistress. At 300 plus miles per hour on water, you're dealing with phenomena that didn't even have names when people started this madness. There's something called ground effect, where the air compressed between the boat and water creates unpredictable lift. There's cavitation, where the water literally vaporizes around the propeller or jet outlet, causing sudden loss of thrust. And there's the brutal reality that water becomes exponentially less forgiving as speed increases. Modern safety equipment hasn't kept pace with the speeds. Ejection seats don't work when you're 18 inches off the water. Parachutes are useless when you go from 300 miles per hour to zero in less than a second. The G-forces involved in a high-speed water crash are so extreme that no amount of padding or restraints can save you. It's like trying to survive jumping off a skyscraper by wearing a better helmet. There's also the insurance problem. Good luck finding an insurance company willing to cover a water speed record attempt. Most sanctioning bodies won't even recognize attempts anymore unless they meet safety standards that are essentially impossible to achieve at these speeds. The Royal Yachting Association stopped recognizing water speed records altogether after too many deaths. Here's what nobody wants to admit. The water speed record is a stupid record. Unlike land speed records, which have practical applications for automotive technology, or air speed records, which advance aviation, going fast on water teaches us almost nothing useful. The boats are so specialized that no technology from them transfers to regular watercraft. It's pure ego and adrenaline, dressed up as scientific advancement. The few teams still working on breaking the record are either wildly optimistic or slightly unhinged. The Quicksilver Project claims they'll hit 400 miles per hour, but they've been saying that for 20 years. The American Challenge team thinks they can reach 350 miles per hour with a boat that looks like a floating stealth bomber, but they can't find anyone brave or stupid enough to drive it. Nigel McKnight, who's attempting the record in Longbow, put it best, We're not advancing science. We're not making boats safer. We're just seeing if we can go very, very fast without dying. It's the purest form of human ambition. Pointless, dangerous, and absolutely magnificent. Despite everything, people are still trying. The current attempts use computer modeling that would have seemed like magic to Donald Campbell. They're using carbon fiber composites that are stronger than steel but lighter than aluminium. The engines are computer-controlled turbines that can adjust thrust in milliseconds. But here's the thing. The water doesn't care about your technology. It doesn't care about your computer models or your carbon fiber. At 300 plus miles per hour, water is chaos incarnate. 
Every ripple is a potential catastrophe. Every gust of wind is a death sentence. The margin for error isn't just small, it's non-existent. The sad truth is that Ken Warby's record might stand forever, not because we can't build faster boats, but because we finally developed enough sense to stop trying. Or maybe we've just run out of people willing to bet their lives on a few miles per hour. The history of water speed records is a testament to human ambition, engineering brilliance, and spectacular stupidity. From Garwood's 45 miles per hour in 1911 to Ken Warby's 317 miles per hour in 1978, we've pushed the boundaries of what's possible on water. We've also filled graveyards with people who discovered those boundaries the hard way. These records represent something uniquely human, the willingness to risk everything for a number, a line in a record book, a moment of glory. It's simultaneously inspiring and insane, brilliant and idiotic. The boats these people built were marvels of engineering, created by some of the smartest people of their generation, all in service of a fundamentally stupid goal. Going very fast on water because someone else went slightly less fast. The water speed record stands as one of the last unconquered frontiers in speed, not because we can't conquer it, but because we finally learned that some frontiers aren't worth the cost. Ken Warby's 317 miles per hour might be the permanent high watermark of human velocity on water, a number that will stand as both an achievement and a warning. So here's to the crazy ones, the speed demons, the madmen who looked at a calm lake and thought, I bet I could die spectacularly on that. They push the boundaries of what's possible, even if what's possible turned out to be monumentally dangerous. Their legacy isn't just numbers in a record box. It's a reminder that sometimes the bravest thing you can do is know when to stop. If you've enjoyed this deep dive into humanity's wettest and wildest speed obsession, smash that subscribe button like it's going 300 miles per hour. Drop a comment below telling me which other insane records you want to hear about. Trust me, humans have tried to go too fast on pretty much everything. And remember, the only thing faster than these boats is how quickly you should hit that notification bell. Until next time, keep your speed reasonable and your hull in the water.